Well, hello everyone and welcome to this first collection of chats and conversations, if you like, that I'm doing. Um, I'm joined here with my very, very good friend, Laura Edwards, who is a fantastic church leader, psychologist, and so many great things in between. She is a mom to two teenagers, wife to a pastor or vicar, whatever it is that helps you explain that word. Um, and you know, this, this conversation that I'm doing, it's just aiming to kind of look at some people's lives, their stories, just strip it all back, look at how they've got to where they are now and kind of what bumps might have come along on the way, what was smooth, what was not, just kind of a real, kind of real chat. And I, thought of Laura to do this because she's one of those people when I get on the phone to her she is just tell it how it is and uh, we've been friends for a really long time now um, you're also one of these friends that I don't have to speak to for ages it could be months but I'll pick up the phone and then we're just nattering for ages and it's always so great well the, the pandemic recently um, made me realize oh we haven't spoken for months picked up the phone we're on the phone for an hour then prompted to think, oh, actually, should we re-enact that for other people to listen? Because I thought it was really great. I came off a phone call feeling really great. And you're actually, you're one of my friends I'm just so proud of because I know your journey a little bit. I'm excited to hear more about it tonight. Um, and I'm really excited that all of you that are watching are going to get to have a little peek inside of Laura Edwards' life. So, Laura, tell us, psychologist and, you know, church leader, what do all those things mean? What do they look like for you? Okay, so um, so church leader, I um, am wife of Daz, and me and Daz lead Ignite Church in Lincoln. So we used to be part of, well, really active part, actually, of Elim Northampton, and uh, Becky and her family really looked after us there. We actually got saved in that church. That's where we met, yeah. in that church, I guess, much yeah. Younger, much younger, mm. um, and... Yeah, so went off to Bible College. Now we are leading a church ourselves in Lincoln, which is a miracle in itself. Um, and at the moment, I am a trainee clinical psychologist alongside that. So um, that's my full time job. Um, and that kind of entails me. So I work in mental health with people with lots of sort of various difficulties, right from like anxiety and depression at one end of the spectrum right up to the other end with kind of psychosis and complex trauma and lots of kind of really extreme problems um so yeah i'm in my second year of my doctorate so i've got another year left and i'll be finally qualified and be a doctor which i'm really excited about um i'll be i'm the first person in my family to go to uni and that was mm -hmm. so feels like a, a milestone there um but yeah that's that's where i'm at at the moment that's what we're doing so uh kind of interesting times and, and an interesting yeah. balance and a juggle I guess. And exciting. Yeah. It's really yeah. exciting. Yeah. So that's where you are now and obviously um, when I first met you I was a lot younger, you were a lot younger, I first met you at the church and you were there with two very small children, you were very young yourself, um, your husband Daz wasn't even in the church let alone a church minister, no. um, I don't think you were married when I first met you. No. So Take us back, but actually let's take you, take us right back to childhood. What was childhood like for you? What was your family unit like? So I, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. So my parents were, my dad uh, worked in finance. My mum uh, has always been a carer. So she's a real looker after of people. <clears throat> and uh, she became a Christian, started going to church and developed a faith when I would have been about seven. So I, I did start going to church as a child, um, but I'd not really, it wasn't kind of my foundation. So by the time I was in my teens, I'd kind of had enough of that and thought I'd go off and do my own thing as you do. Um, but yeah, pretty standard kind of uh, childhood. Um, although when I was, I, I struggled in kind of secondary school. So my parents split up when I was 10, um, which I wasn't, it, it I'm not, I'm not, I'm sure people don't expect their parents to split up, but it felt like a big surprise to me and yeah. I really struggled um, and other kind of trauma-y sort of things happened at that time. Um, and so, yeah, I, I stopped going to church. I kind of, I ran away when I was 15, which is why I've got teenage children now. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I met Daz, yeah. So me and Daz met each other when uh, we were 14 and 15 uh, from quite different backgrounds. So although I would say my family were, working class Daz had kind of grown up in and out of care 
um, and was sort of the criminal of the estate. And so I got into like a bit of a gang, a bit of a gang, it was, I guess got into a, a gang when I was uh, in my early teens, uh, doing a lot of kind of drinking and smoking and drugs and things that weren't very helpful. Um, yeah, and that's when me and him got together. So that's kind of my early years, uh, very sort of stable to begin with, but got quite messy. Kind of so like when, you, when you say you ran away from home, where did you run to? You ran to Daz. Yeah. So I think lots was going on at that time, but I, I just remember weirdly, um, one of the things I remember was uh, being in kind of just sat in secondary school, meeting lots of new people. Parents had just split up, my dad had left. Um, my nan, who also lived with us, um, so I'm, I'm aware this is a lot of overshare for some people. Mm. <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. <laughs> but I'm, I'm quite open with my story. Um, but my nan, who lived with us, died as well. And that all happened in a really short space yeah. of time. And the thing that stuck out to me was when uh, I just, as I was saying, I just started secondary school, um, my mum, we couldn't afford a TV licence at the time because of everything that had happened. And so home for me felt really um quiet miserable um no distractions and so at that point it was much better for me to be out with friends and so I spent all my time out with people um my mum was fantastic by the way you know she did her absolute best with me and my brother um but yeah home for me was just too empty at the time so I spent a lot of time out outside and when I found alcohol um I remember getting drunk for the first time with my friends in a park thinking, where has this been all my life? Like, right. I'm free from all my worries and I'm confident and I'm outgoing. And that sort of started a bit of a downward spiral. But yeah, so, so essentially when I ran away, that was me and Daz kind of, my mum had said, no, you're not um, going to stay out at a boy's house overnight. And I said, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. And how was that for your mum at the time? Really difficult. I think yeah. she... Um, I've, my kids now are the age that I was yeah. when I was kind of going through that season and I can't imagine how difficult that must have been for her so she was contacting social services I had kind of welfare officers coming out visiting trying oh. to get her back in school I remember I was six months pregnant at Darren's house watching river dance on telly and uh, the school like welfare officer was sitting on the end of the bed trying to talk me back into going to school and I just thought firstly how embarrassing like what, why didn't I care that I'd invited her into the bedroom to sit on the end of the bed but um yeah that's how bad things have got essentially at that time how old were you when you were pregnant so I was pregnant with Liam when I was 15 and uh had him when I was 16 mm -hmm. um and so me and Daz got we were kind of given a council flat we were only 16 but we had got like a tenancy agreement with the council even though we we're only 16 with guarantors um so that we could have our own place uh yeah. when Liam was born so yeah, yeah. 16 year olds how yeah. how did you how did you feel when you found out you were pregnant what was that like I don't know I feel like it was such a whirlwind of a time of kind of making sort of shocking decisions and doing crazy things I remember I was absolutely terrified because I've always been little like as in physically yeah and I remember thinking, I'm just going to die. Like, I can't carry a baby yeah. into birth. Yeah. I'll just die. But, um, yeah. but yeah, um, kind of scared, but yeah. just a bit in a whirlwind, really, just because that year, well, two years, had just been a bit of a, yeah, like a strange dream. How did you tell Darren that you were having a baby? Well, Daz was, wor <laughs> Daz was working at a nightclub. And I remember thinking when I found out I was pregnant, I found out I was pregnant at 10 o'clock at night at a Tesco's in Mere Way because <laughs> I've gone up there with... I found out I was pregnant at a Tesco or a Sainsbury's because you go to the shop to buy the test, don't you? Yeah, just at totally to... different circumstances, but... <laughs> anyway. I couldn't have wanted to get home, yeah, so I just went in the Tesco toilets to check. So, so yeah, <gasps> Yeah. He was working at a nightclub and yeah. I just remembered, even though I was only 15 years old, I remember thinking um, a child shouldn't have their parents working in a nightclub that is not safe. Right. So I said to him, Daz, in nine months, I think you're going to need to find a different job and we're going to have to stop swearing. And he was like, why is that? So I said, oh, we're going to have a baby. Um, I don't know how, why I was so, it sounds quite relaxed, doesn't it? Yeah. I think, I and how did you take it? 
he was absolutely buzzing because he's one of 12 children. He's the right. eldest of 12. So he was very, he'd always looked after younger siblings and he'd always wanted, well, I'm saying he'd always wanted, he was 15, but even as a kid, he wanted a family. And Interesting. He a big man. Even as a, he was 15, he was working in yeah. a club, do you know what I mean? So we grew up too quickly, essentially. But I do, often there was, times that I've looked back at your kids as they've, they, as they've grown up and I've looked at you and Darren being so young knowing that you were even younger when you know before I met you when you had the children and I've always thought that the kids are so good the kids are so chilled like I've seen more family like better background and better circumstances and people not be as chill so it's really interesting I don't know whether that's just like maybe a big grace thing or but I have often looked at your family and gone that's kind of how I want to be when I have children. But your circumstances were not what you would have expected to yeah. have kind of resulted in that way. So I find that really fascinating. So you told Darren that you're pregnant. Essentially, you're, all, you're both kind of happy. Why do you think that was? I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. So, so there was nothing of kind of faith at that point. Um, yeah. I wonder if at the time we were two kind of fairly lost people, young yeah. people who needed stability. And yeah. I do not recommend anybody needing stability goes out and has a kid because it's not the way to do it. But I think maybe knowing that actually this means something and it means we're together for the long haul. And yeah. it maybe just felt like, something long term like that's it now we're a family and this yeah. is gonna be all right I don't know but yeah. yeah yeah so tell me how you then ended up at Elam Church in Northampton with your because you ha went on to have a second child how long was it before you ended up having another child so not very <laughs> yeah so um we so we got we had our flat um Liam must have been I think he was only one and we were already thinking, um, this isn't that bad. This isn't that difficult. And I'm not saying that because I know it is really hard to have yeah. a baby. And it is yeah. really, really difficult to not have any sleep. I think that's one of the graces of being so young. Mm -hmm. um, being 16, you've got a lot of energy. We didn't really know all the parenting mistakes we were making, probably. Wow. So I wasn't yeah. as worried. Yeah, yeah. Sense, we didn't fully know what we were doing, but we tr yeah. just did the best we could together. Um, and so by the time Liam was one, we were like, wouldn't it be like, our parents are going to go absolutely mad, but would it not be nice to have another one now so that we've got, and, as, and I would have been 16, 17, having that strange conversation. Um, and we decided that we would like to have another one. So we had, I had Sophie when I was 18. And uh, by that time, we, we were in a two bedroom flat. So we put in for a transfer uh, for a house. And that was like miraculous how that happened. I don't know anybody currently who would want to exchange a three bedroom house for a little flat, you know, in, in a rough area, but they did. Um, and so we transferred and uh, my mum, who was still going to church, her own church, um, said, oh, Laura, um, there's a really good church down the road from your new house. Why don't mm -hmm. you start taking the kids? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I did. And I remember yeah. thinking, I, I I had a faith. There was something in there. Um, I did. I when I was a child, I read the Bible a lot and I'd remembered bits, and I knew that I believed there was a God. And mm -hmm. I knew that when I had parties and we had lots of friends around at the flat, there'd be lots of kind of wild behaviour. Every time I'd had a bit too much to drink, I'd always end up talking about God <laughs> to my friends, wow. even though I wasn't living that life at all. Yeah, graceful in it from Jesus, you know, allowing me to speak. Um, so. I thought, yeah, I do want that for my kids. I want to take mm -hmm. the kids to church, even if I'm not quite sure where I'm at. Yeah. yeah. Some things are messy. So we, we trundled on down to Elim Northampton. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, Sophie, I didn't bring Sophie to begin with because she was tiny and I felt like I couldn't cope with both. So I used to mm -hmm. just bring Liam. But once Sophie was big enough to go into the creche, I, I brought both of them along with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... And was there a point where you... I mean, from the first get go, did you feel like that was home? Is there something you wanted to do? Or was it very much, it was just a break? It was something for the kids? 
um, was there a point where you were like, actually, I feel really serious about this church stuff? Or did it, at any point did it become quite a, a real thing or become a lifestyle thing for you? Yeah, so initially, I remember the very first Sunday we went. So my mum agreed that she'd come with me for a few weeks. Yeah. Kind of until I've made friends and settled in because she's good like that <laughs> mm-hmm. so um it was very different as well back then like so different we had all flags along the front of the church lots of churches did didn't they in, in the yeah. early 2000s um and I'd not been to a church a Pentecostal church before so it was mm-hmm. a real experience for me and I sat next to if any of you guys know Mick Wood I sat next to Mick yes. Wood the first Sunday in church for anyone who doesn't know, Mick Woods, he's still going strong. He's the church caretaker and he's literally Mr. Northampton Elim. He lives right next to the church. He's still going. Like, there's still pictures of him working at the church. And I, I think he's way past retirement, yeah. but he's incredible. But yes, you know, he's touched all of our lives. Go on, you know him. So yeah, you sat next to him. Yeah, Mick and Diana are absolute treasures of the church, aren't they? Yeah. But Mick was filled with the spirit and laughing, full of joy and speaking in tongues. And I patted my mum on the shoulder because I thought he was having a stroke. (laughs) (laughs) And she said, no, I think that's what they do in these kind of churches. (laughs) So I was like freaked out. But but straight away, my mum, both of us were like, these people are so happy. And my mum said... Um, after a few weeks she, she was like these the pastors know their bibles inside out they preach from the heart and they preach from the word this is this needs to be your home and I felt loved I felt um, accepted um, interestingly uh, I was convicted very early on that I wasn't married and I told everybody that I was married even though I wasn't <laughs> so, why did you feel like you had to tell everyone you were married um, I felt like very early on, I, I got a grounding in like understanding the Bible and just yeah. I was keen. I want, and, and I felt this sense of, you know, when you just have this mirror, the Bible, mm-hmm. like Jesus is not uh, condemning us, mm-hmm. but, but he gently shows us where things aren't right in our lives. Mm-hmm. And I don't necessarily think Jesus was telling me you need to go and get married, but I immediately felt that sense of, hang on, I'm different to everybody else here. Mm-hmm. And um, I know there's things in my life that I do want to change. And I guess marriage for me felt like something official, which maybe mm-hmm. symbolized things that were underlying. So, mm-hmm. so maybe marriage kind of was the official kind of covering, but mm-hmm. actually there was lots of things in my life and in my lifestyle that I knew weren't honouring to God and, and, and not honouring to me either that mm-hmm. I wanted to change um, but yeah I settled in really quickly and I uh, joined a life group which then were called cell groups I think which just mm-hmm. makes me think of prison yeah. <laughs> um, and I was the the I would have been 18 and the next mm-hmm. youngest person in that cell group was 55 wow <laughs> and anybody that remembers Dorothy will know she's an absolute treasure she's not with us anymore sadly but she was the leader of that house group that was just up the road from my house mm. and um after being in that cell group for a few weeks I realized that these people had something that I didn't so I had a little mm. bit of knowledge about the bible I had some church attendance in my bag um but I didn't know Jesus personally I didn't yeah. know him I didn't have a, a um a two-way relationship with him and that was really the turning point for me where I was like, I want to commit myself to following Jesus, not just to reading the Bible and praying now and again, but to actually uh, being part of part of the body of Christ mm. and, and one of his followers. Oh, that's so great. And I love, I remember Dorothy. She was one of the best grannies in the house. She sounded like a Disney princess when she spoke as well. And I just think it's such um, a great example of how needed our older gener our older older generation are in our church because you'd think well it wouldn't connect an 18 year old teenage pregnancy is unmarried with you know someone who's been in the church a long time older lady but it it just that's what happens in church where unfortunately there's times when it goes horribly wrong and you sh- you know that I would feel so sorry for anyone where they've had bad experiences but that's love and that's, I think that's Jesus so how did sorry. She swept. There were times where, so she would have been in her seventies. 
and I used to go around for coffee with her and she'd tell me all about her family um, but mm -hmm. I'd tell her about mine too and there were times where me and Daz would have an argument where it'd all kick off at home and I'd pack the kids up in the buggy and I'd run up the road to Dorothy's and I met her oh. in church, you know, so yeah, yeah absolutely. so good, but God really positioned her right where you needed her yeah. to be, locationally and emotionally so Darren when you told him did you tell him we ought to get married or did he you know did you propose what how did that conversation play out so <laughs> I, I started going to church and committed to following Jesus a good probably two two and a half years before Daz came along on the journey um and anybody who knows Daz I think we're both quite kind of strong characters um, he's a very strong character and there was there was no way he's he was a lad's lad he um, was still kind of dabbling in he, he was working he had an honest job he was still dabbling in kind of sort of dealing drugs behind the scenes which I was more and more uncomfortable and unhappy about um, he was spending lots of lots of time with he's got a very big family as well um, and mm. lots of kind of male dominated groups of you know just a really big family mm. um, and so, yeah, I, over time, there was kind of a, a divide building in the way that I felt I wanted to live and that mm -hmm. I wanted to bring the kids up and in the way that he felt he wanted to. He's always, he was always quite honourable, you know, he was always a good mm -hmm. dad. Um, but our relationship was quite volatile and um, still quite a lot of drinking and parties and things going on that I felt really conflicted about, I think, because... Um, I was really aware of being drawn in two directions yeah. and uh, tried as hard as I could to get him to come to church and would preach at him and yeah it would just end up in full-blown arguments that was really difficult um, and it came to a head I think we'd had a there'd been kind of a really explosive evening we'd fallen out uh, and I'd felt unsafe and me and the kids had a runaway and we'd gone to stay with my mum and one of uh we were trying to kind of reconcile our relationship and i said you know if we if we're going to make this work we you know whether or not you want to become a christian that's another matter that's your decision but we need to stop the drinking and the drugs and we need to um i really want to get married i don't want to live um the way we are anymore um and i want you to be committed to me just as much as i'm committed to you um, and he agreed straight away. He was like, I'll do anything to have you guys back. Um, oh. And so, yeah, we, we got married. So it was a bit of a shotgun wedding, really. It wasn't mm. ideal. I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> and I wouldn't recommend, you know, looking back now, I think God has used everything we've been through. Yeah. But I would never recommend um, somebody staying in a relationship that's quite as volatile or as, I don't like using the word toxic, but it was kind of a toxic relationship. Yeah. Then very different picture to if people have only maybe met the dads over the last decade or so um very different picture to what we see your husband at now so obviously now we said at the beginning he is a minister of a church how did that happen well um definitely not through me that's that's mm -hmm. definite um so obviously it got to a point where I'd, I was in a prayer meeting one evening at church and I was praying about our relationship and about how we were on these two different paths and I didn't know how long we could go in these two different directions before there was a split in the middle. And I felt that God said to me, you need to, um, you need to stop uh, like directing him with your words and you need to start witnessing to him with your actions. You just right. need to be, you need to be who you say you are. Don't keep trying yeah. to tell him to go to church. Don't keep trying to preach to him. Just be his wife and just do what you're doing and just yeah. love Jesus. And I had this dream where I woke up with a verse as well, um, which I got out of my bed and I flicked to it in the middle of the mm -hmm. night. And it said, um, I, can't, I can never remember where the verse is. It takes me ages to find it. That's fine. But it basically says that they were, it said they were outside the synagogue and they were amazed and scared at the things that were going on in there. And I felt like it was saying, Daz won't come to church because he's scared. He's intimidated by what's going on in there, the spiritual and the supernatural. Yeah. I was like, okay, I can, I can accept that. 
so from that point I just decided I'm just going to pray for him and I'm not going to try and encourage him to go to church anymore that's that it's water under the bridge and God will mm -hmm. do what he's going to do and I'd kind of resign myself to the fact that he may never want to be a Christian I was kind of okay with that by that point because I didn't want to force him to do something that wasn't him and then uh over a period of about, it must have been about a year, things started happening where Daz himself, who was like fiercely kind of atheist, um, God kind of just started showing himself to Daz through, through lots of little things. Uh, one of the things was that Daz had decided that um, he did, he did want to research kind of religion and stuff. But, and he'd said this prayer, whoever this God is out there, whether you're Allah or whether you're Buddha or whether you're the, the God of Christians, uh, send me your book. And I won't, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to come to any church unless I find out the truth straight from you. Okay. And then one night, I, I didn't know this, this was a private prayer. My mum turned up with this massive old lectern Bible that she'd, she'd been given by someone and she just turned up raining with a hood up saying, I don't know why, but God just told me to bring this here. And Dad just started reading it. I thought, <laughs> what's going on? It was so old, I thought I was gonna catch TB from the dust. <laughs> <laughs> Disgusting. But he just started reading. He, um, he started attending sort of men's church events, getting to know people. And this was all kind of things, I, I couldn't quite work out what was going on. And then one night he just came home after, I think it was a men's football and pie night of all nights and said, I'm saved, I'm committed to Jesus, I wanna follow God. And, and he, he literally changed overnight. And today, right. sorry, carrying on. Yeah, nice um, somebody from church sent me a message from Elam Northampton uh, about something unrelated and I scrolled up and there was a message on there from 2008 and I'd sent it to her the weekend does have made a commitment to follow Jesus and yeah. I said um, I said Karen I, I just need to message you to tell you what's happened <laughs> yeah um but Daz has made a commitment to follow Jesus this weekend. I can't believe it. And I said, I don't know how to feel because it's as if all my prayers have come true in one night. And now I don't know what to do with it. Um, so, yeah, amazing. That's amazing. And um, I remember, I think it, it, I think it was like the same week or same, same day. But for you in your life, I remember you taking on a significant step in your faith journey, but also in your kind of career, if you like very similar times was it do you know what I'm talking about where I think you got a job at the church yes. it was the same weekend it was the same I thought weekend. it was and I just and I remember yeah. people like on the staff muttering going isn't this amazing and like almost like a, oh thank goodness for that because I don't know whether there was like a this makes it so much easier that now she's on the staff and she's got the support of home and how did he you know it just connected and like what did that that feel like because also while this was going on you were almost taking a like a higher level in your your faith book I guess because it became part of your career yeah yeah so I I'd kind of got baptized around that time as well yeah uh, but that that weekend Daz came home I think it was on the Friday night mm. uh and and this all blew up and he'd he'd made that commitment to God and we were just like he was I'd never seen him cry before he was crying mm -hmm. he was praising God he was apologizing to me for all the things that had happened in the past and, and being really anyway and then on the Sunday um I found out that I'd been and I was so proud so proud that I'd been offered the job as admin assistant at church and it was for I remember 22 hours a week yeah it was my first proper job and I'd prayed so hard for it and there were people that had gone for the job that were a lot more qualified than I was yeah. and and I was expecting to get it so yeah. Yeah, that weekend, it was like God saying to me, I've got you. Yeah. This is all in hand. And I remember that you had a massive office as well. I did. I, loved was... I had a leather sofa in that office. <laughs> it, was, think. it was so exciting. I remember being so excited. I was only at school at the time, but I remember being really excited that you, you went onto the team because I thought, oh, the team looks really cool. Um, but that, that was so exciting. And then tell us about how then between there and we ended up at Bible College. Uh, just tell us about that. And then, you know, your, where it sort of came, your calling to kind of, or your desire to start studying into mental health. Uh, tell us about that. So I think 
we'd probably been I'd been working at church dad's been a Christian probably for about a year it was as soon as he got saved he gave up his business which was right. ridiculous but he was like no I don't want to work for myself I want to serve God full time and your dad will remember he used to come and knock on the door at church every day of the week and say pastor Jason what can I do for you what can I do for the church and your dad would be like can you just go and get a job and provide for your family <laughs> 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 after about um a year I think we all agreed that that it would be good that Daz was had a call in on his life to go and study theology at Bible mm-hmm. College and um, kind of apply for ministry himself. Uh, and he had such a desire to kind of plant a church on on an estate like ours um, mm-hmm. and reach back out to his family and the people that that he'd grown up with as well. Yeah. Um, so we applied, we went to Bible college. I've never, I barely ever left Northampton. So we moved over mm-hmm. to Malvern, our whole family, which was amazing and terrifying. And, and you were there anyway, Beck, weren't you? Cause you guys. Yeah, I was there. I was a year, I was, would have been done a year already before you came. And I actually, rem- ashamedly, I remember like going to dad's, like patronizing me. It's really hard, you know, like theology is like, like I knew what I was on about and he was going to really struggle. I was like, I don't know what I was, like some posh pastor's kid. It was like, <laughs> oh, the new convert off the Calverton State is going to struggle. And I tell you what, it wasn't, it was a matter of days before I was eating my words. And I don't know if I ever apologised for this, but I remember just being swallowed up because he was so much holier than me. He was so much smarter than me. He was speaking words that I didn't even know. And I was like, what? What did I say that for? It was just amazing. He was, I was a lot younger. I was, he was a lot younger. Also super judgy, actually. <laughs> if you look back on those years, Daz cringes and he's got he has to make so many apologies to so many people when he thinks he always says, Back in my first year of Bible college, I thought I knew everything. <laughs> he did. I think he did. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't. He didn't. But, but he said he did. He almost went from being so far away from church to like <sighs> like so intense like eating it all up yeah. like prayer meetings all the time I remember inviting this to prayer meetings I was just like I'm just chilling watching tv in the common room but yeah. it, it's just it's like he was catching up on all the years yeah not in the church and it was quite refreshing um so how was that for you because I guess you went as a family um which I guess can have its challenges at rooting but then also he's the one that was studying kind of having the credential going to the credentials how was that for you um like we you know pastor's wife title what how did that feel for you I absolutely loved it I (laughs) absolutely loved it at the time I loved I love living in Malvern um where the college was yeah yeah. oh yeah sorry um and I think it was such a it was the complete opposite I guess that community living living within the um, Bible College campus was such a different experience from what we'd ever had so we were kind of living right. in a Christian community um, and and I would really cherish the fact that my kids got those three years to live amongst other believers to be looked mm-hmm. after nurtured um my our daughter Sophie my kids were like the naughtiest on campus they're they're such lovely kids but weirdly it's like in that community they just unleashed Sophie was kind of caught stealing uh food out of the student lounge and she smashed a stained glass window accidentally but yeah it was it was a bit of a nightmare um but yeah just really lovely time really lovely time and uh yeah, it, it kind of got to the third year. I just worked, I worked in the housekeeping team, mm-hmm. uh, just sort of changing beds in the conference centre. And I absolutely loved that. And I didn't really, I didn't have any aspirations to kind of be anything other than a mum and a pastor's wife. Like, I was buzzing about that. I remember thinking, I cannot believe this has happened to me. Um, and it was just in second or third year, I remember Jeff said, like, Laura, we think you'd be able to study the the degree as well if you want to like you're really welcome to apply because we think you you've got it in you to do it and I'm thinking yeah yeah and, I'll, and I'd love to stay here another three years and as we got talking though um Daz was like I think you could do something different and we ended up having weirdly we ended up having this big argument um about I was saying I don't want to study I don't need to study I don't need to prove who I am like 
you know, I'm happy with who I am and where I am. And he was like, okay, okay. So he went back to lectures and then I started Googling uni courses straight away. And when it, by the time he got back, I was like, actually, I do want to study. And uh, I decided that I wanted to do psychology because we'd had some kind of marriage counselling with uh, Sharon, the um, clinical psychologist there. Sorry about that. My daughter's just walked into the kitchen. Hello, Sophie. What's that? Yeah, so we have had marriage counselling, um, which was phenomenal uh, while we were at Bible College. And uh, yeah, it, it, it really changed our relationship and improved it kind of another step further. And I thought I would love to be able to help somebody in the way that Sharon helped her. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. I feel like that guy on the BBC News where he's <laughs> with the kids of the walker. Um, no, don't worry. We're like this is very authentic. We're all at home, aren't we? Everyone understands. Um, so you went on to study. Do you, well, you went back to college, didn't you? First to get some. Yeah. Yeah. So stuff. I sat an access course while we were still yeah. in Melbourne for the final year. You, you were almost going backwards, weren't you? In your yeah, so I dropped out of school yeah. when I was in my final year when I was 15. I didn't get my GCSEs. And I okay. think I felt really sad, actually. I think my family were really sad because uh, my teachers had said, she'll, she'll go to uni. She'll be, you know, the first one in the family to go to uni. And I think there was that real sort of sense of, oh, you know. She, You're she, making up for it now. When yeah. are you becoming a doctor? In It will be hopefully ne next year if I okay. finish my course, yeah. So what compelled you to do psychology yeah so so for me there was there's a mixture of things there was the uh kind of help we'd had from sharon so she was a clinical psychologist and i was blown away by her wisdom and uh, kind of just the, the few things that she said to us had such a big impact on how we related in our in our marriage um so was that but i i became aware during my time with sharon that I'd been somebody for my whole life that had really struggled with anxiety. And I'd never put a name or a label to it until that point. Um, and I'm not, I don't necessarily think having a label um, is a good thing, but it, it really helped me to understand what was going on for me and a lot of things I struggled with. Um, and so that was, that was the other thing. I, I felt like I'd like to learn more about that, but also that the way that she had helped me with that I wanted to be able to offer that to other people so when you um so you were quite maybe you were anxious in what kind of ways would that, that sort of come about so when I looked back after I kind of mm. understood anxiety I looked back right back to my early childhood oh, I don't even know where it kind of really stemmed from but I was always a, I've always been a real thinker so I can remember so far back having lots of kind of thoughts of uh, being worried about things so uh, back in the 90s it was mad cow disease so I would have been seven or eight and I was really scared of eating my roast dinner because I'd seen on the news about mad cow disease and so I, I was like a little sponge when I was little I absorbed lots of information without context and I'd whittle about things um, and I think my family as well we are doers um, we're kind of thinkers and we're doers we don't feel much and we don't really talk much about emotion or you know we don't like to go near sadness and we don't so we just kind of get on with it and I guess it's kind of a bit of a British thing as well isn't it with the stiff upper lip and we, we just kind of crack on um, so yeah, when, when I look back, I realised that I'd spent a lot of time throughout my childhood and subsequent teenage years and adulthood um, feeling very anxious about lots of different things, usually about health, but also kind of change. I didn't like change. Um, I used to worry about war um, and um, yeah, I can't remember what I was going to say next. There was, some, <laughs> there was something else, but it's gone. But <laughs> Do you still do you still feel like you almost live with a certain a certain level of anxiety in your life? Um, do you yeah, so that and then if you do, do you feel like you kind of combat it or you kind of free from that now? What's it like for you right now? I guess that so I think so first of all, anxiety is is kind of very normal. It's mm -hmm. it's uh something that's inbuilt in all of us and it kind of fear is an emotion that helps us escape from danger so it's something that 
is important and like every other emotion like sadness or happiness it's god given and it needs to be there because it's it's got a purpose um but i think for me looking back because of patterns of thinking and the way my relationships were that anxiety was kind of allowed to grow and get out of control um and i didn't used to speak to people about it so i'd, I'd fret away I'd, I'd sit researching things and really get myself in a tears and i'd um i used to lose i'd lost a lot of weight because i'd lose mm -hmm. my appetite i'd not sleep um and so i had a few kind of periods of time when i look back where maybe for months on end i'd be really really struggling with fear and anxiety um, and i'd say that now that isn't the case um i was really surprised actually when um with kind of lockdown and coronavirus i was a bit concerned about how i would cope with it i wondered yeah. if it would become really anxious mm -hmm. um but, but I feel like there's kind of a combination of the things I've learned myself and the, what I know about myself and, and what helps me and what doesn't um, has really helped me to get on top of that. So mm -hmm. I think whereas before it'd be like a roller coaster, so I'd either be fine or I'd be really, really, really anxious. I think now it, it's kind of more steady. So I do, I do still get anxious. I think we all don't we, we all feel anxious about certain yeah. things. I think it'd be unusual not to. Um, but, it, but it hasn't got out of control for me for quite, you know, probably a number of years. Mm -hmm. So what would you maybe say to people who are maybe watching or know people that are really struggling, particularly right now with the, the, the pandemic, from um, a psychologist point of view and also from a pastoral point of view, because you're both those things, with, and also from your personal faith and from experience personal anxieties yourself, from all those sort of four factors, what would you kind of say at this time to those people? Yeah, it's really good that you've said that as well from all, all the different angles. Yeah. We were talking the other day on the phone, weren't we? You mentioned that mm -hmm. earlier. And I came off the phone and I said to Daz, I love talking to Becky because I bring that practical and scientific side and you bring in the spiritual and the sacred. Um, and it's so important, isn't it, having those two together? Mm -hmm. um, so what I'd say, first of all, if you're feeling anxious right now, um, I'd say it's really, really normal. It would be strange right now if you weren't feeling some level of anxiety. It might not be all the time, um, and it might not be a really high level, but it's really normal, and it leads us to do funny things. So it leads people sometimes to go and bulk buy things because we worry that we're going to run out, and it helps us to feel in control to have stuff, yeah. or it might lead us to um, to not want to go out very much, which that's the government rules anyway. But but it kind of causes us to do lots of different things to feel in control. So so firstly, if you're feeling anxious, it's really normal. It it's really normal right now. Secondly. Um, I think if you are, there are some things that you can do to help kind of get on top of that a little bit. So these are probably things you already know, but just kind of limiting the amount of news you're reading. So it's important to keep up with the facts. It's important to kind of maybe, you know, check the news once a day, keep in touch with what's going on. But if you notice that you're kind of uh, reloading the page every 10 minutes, which is a good warning flag to me that I'm quite anxious. Um, actually you can just set some set some goals and set some um boundaries i guess with the news to, to put that to one side uh, really important to try not to read lots of conspiracy theories and to get caught up in all of that stuff as well having routines um one thing that really helps me is to go out for a walk once a day um i'll take the dog out in my lunch break you know so that i'm not sort of stuck for too long uh, within what i'm doing um Something else to me, so when I used to be really anxious and I used to struggle, Christians used to say to me, um, which I know they were trying to be helpful, but it, particularly my mum, <laughs> <laughs> the, the Bible says 365 times in it, do not fear. So it's a command from God, you shouldn't be anxious, you've got nothing to be anxious about. And although I, I understand that perspective, I remember feeling like maybe I'm not a very good Christian, maybe I haven't got enough faith if, if I'm anxious, maybe I'm, I'm not connected somehow. And I think Jesus would want to say to you right now that he's got you as well as everybody else. Um, he's holding you and you are safe and he, everything is, is, he's got you and he's got you contained. And whether you are kind of the valiant Peter or whether you're the doubting Thomas, he can he can hold both of you at the same time so i'm definitely the more cynical end i would be 
um, unfortunately I would be a Thomas saying, Jesus, I want to see the scars in your hands. I want evidence that everything's going to be okay. Um, but he doesn't dismiss Thomas. He Thomas is one of his as well, just as you yeah. are. As yeah. I. And he was more than willing to give proof to Thomas. Yeah. As well. And it's recorded and I love that. So I, I love one of those parts when Jesus came out. It's one of the things I really remember. Because um, he didn't have to come and prove himself. He didn't have to leave the scars in his hands. Um, and he didn't have to be touched, you know, when you've been wounded. But he was like, go on, bit of another them. So yeah. I love that. It's like he's not, so, offended by, he's not offended by Thomas's questions or doubts or concerns. His weaknesses. Yeah. He can handle them. So that's incredible. There's just two more things, actually, that I picked up on your story that I just want you to speak into um, before we finish. Firstly, what would you say to mothers, parents right now whose children, teenage children, have maybe run away in the physical sense or maybe just in the emotional sense, have maybe left church, left their faith or have just gone off on a bad um, bad influence? Maybe not even a bad influence, they're just, they're just not loving Jesus, they're not loving the church. What would you say um, for them? Oh, gosh, I'd say when I think back to where I was at um on the surface I looked like the most probably the most disrespectful uncaring disinterested um young person I my mum would have definitely thought I wasn't interested in God she would have thought that I didn't believe anymore and that my life was kind of down the pot and but actually below the surface I hung on to God through all of that I still would have, if somebody, my life was a mess, but if somebody had have asked me, I would have said I'm a Christian, I would have said I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus, I had my Bible the whole time. Um, so I'd just say keep praying because God has got it. God's mm -hmm. the, big, the big picture. He sees the big picture, he sees the beginning and the end. Yeah. You can't control your kids, but he can look after them, no matter where yeah. they're going, if they're not physically with you. Um, but yeah, I feel like my life, has just been so God so very clearly plucked us out of such um a difficult situation yeah. and um I there's there was nothing necessarily that anybody else did around me you know my mum couldn't have brought me back into that it had mm -hmm. to be it had to be God that's brilliant and the second thing what would you say to spouses right now that are doing their faith alone yeah again just keep praying to, I, I think I'd got to that point as I said earlier where I kind of felt like you know if, if Daz never makes a commitment I'll be really sad about that but actually I'm okay with it and um and I feel like I, I don't think God responded and saved Daz because I did as I was told I don't think that at all I think he had a plan um just really hand them over you know even even do it physically like practically like imagine yourself just handing them over to god and just letting go of that rope because i think it can become a tug of war and the more you pull one way the more he's going to pull you know the partner is going to pull the other way if you just mm -hmm. let go of that fight and let go of that rope give give the give your end to jesus let him do the pulling let him woo because it's not a fight is it it's a relationship um, and just pray for the miraculous because that's what it takes. That's what it had to take in my life. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to end this session, which has been incredible. I've loved speaking to you and I'm loving that everyone else is getting to listen in. Uh, but let's just end with quick fire. I want to finish the sentence. No, it's fine. You can do a little uh, but we'll try and think of the first thing that comes into your head. I'm that's sensible. Um, life before Jesus was chaos life with him is contained so <laughs> <laughs> oh that's good oh it's been so good talking to you laura and i'm so pleased we've got to do this and you know bless you everyone that's been watching and i hope that that's been really enjoyable for you or spoke to you in some of the ways if you've got any questions then you can just post them to us on our lcf post page or i think there's a chat happening or just below anything like that and we'll love you and leave you thanks so much for being with us and thank you laura see you soon bye guys